Welcome to our Ask the Expert series for adults living with hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. I am so happy to be here today with Dr. Mark Luciano, a neurosurgeon, and Dr. Abe Mogakar, a neurologist with the Cerebrofluid Center for CSF Disorders here at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and also with my coworker, Jennifer Bouchard, the Education Manager at the Hydrocephalus Association. So, focusing on adults living with hydrocephalus, we received a great question, and we hear this in one variation or, other, or the other, either from phone calls we receive at the office or on Facebook. So I'm gonna read it as it came in on Facebook, and let's tackle it, shall we? I am 25 and was diagnosed as a child with hydrocephalus and have not had a shunt revision since then. I moved but haven't found a new neurosurgeon. Should I? I guess we can start with the briefest answer. Yes. <laughs> and then also we could say congratulations. Yeah. Uh, yes. there, there, are, there are many, luckily there are many patients who have shunts that had treated hydrocephalus in, in infancy that have had no problems and, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, often we don't know if the hydrocephalus has continued all that time uh, or if the, the shunt is actually acting after all those decades. But in any case, uh, we do know that there are many patients out there that have not had a problem and uh, we're happy that you're one of them. What we don't know is, is if that success predicts any further problems in the future. Uh, there's no you know, what we call bell-shaped curve. Uh, there's, it's, it's widely distributed as to how many problems a person may have and when during their lifetime. Uh, we do see patients who've gone for 20 years and had no problem, and, but then have uh, problems and concerns after a period of time. As a result, we think that everyone who has had the diagnosis of hydrocephalus and has a shunt should have um, a neurosurgeon who knows them, who has seen them when they're doing well, has some imaging available. We don't think really it's necessary to have frequent visits, but if you can uh, have a neurosurgeon know who you are, when you're doing well, and have the baseline pictures, then should anything arise in the next year or the next 10 years, uh, then you'll get optimal treatment at that time. So it's more like you don't want to meet your neurosurgeon for the first time when you're in the ER. Right, and he doesn't know how you've been and he doesn't know uh, what your ventricles look like at that time. So it, it helps a great deal to have that. And it's really, I, I see uh, one or two patients almost in every clinic who are coming to me in that kind of situation. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure to see them in that, in that uh, healthy state. So you shouldn't feel bad going to see your doctor when everything is going well. You should meet, your, meet a new doctor, let them get to know you in a time when you're not in crisis, mm -hmm. so that when you may end up in crisis, it's not a surprise to them and, and you are literally shaking hands for the first time over um, a hospital bed. But there's no need to, to see, see the patient perhaps every year or anything like that. In other words, that kind of follow-up won't, won't be necessary. But now we know who you are, we have your baseline, anytime there's a problem. So you both manage hydrocephalus patients in different ways as a neurologist and as a neurosurgeon. So what is, and you probably will answer this differently, so this will be fun and interesting. How often do you want to see your patients and how often do you want to see your patients? I'd love to see the patients that are doing well every week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that would really give us a good perspective of how, how shunting is, can be very successful. The problem is that, uh, uh, the world of hydrocephalus is a little bit like a snowball from the perspective of, of, of caregivers. In other words, there are more and more people out there with shunts, and that's a good thing. That means they're surviving and doing well in life. Right. But we can't, as, as often pediatric neurosurgeons, and I was trained also as a pediatric neurosurgeon, we saw the patients at regular intervals, in a sense, well visits as well during early childhood. Yearly. I yes. know my daughter was told we needed to go in yearly, yes. even if nothing was Especially going on. Especially in the first, and first years. she got older, every, when she visited, yeah. you know, 15 every two yeah. years, if nothing. So as you can imagine, if you take that same patient for their lifespan, mm -hmm. uh, and if you saw all of them yearly, you wouldn't have, I would be seeing a lot of well patients, which would be a pleasant clinic, but we wouldn't have time to see the patients who need us. So when we have patients who are adults who know themselves, know, uh, and perhaps the families around them, know kind of when symptoms can arise or questions arise, we have a very low threshold to say, that could be a problem with hydrocephalus, we'll see you. And so we try and, and see patients whenever uh, there is a concern. Uh, but we don't, in adult hydrocephalus, very frequently ask for regular visits. Of course, the post-op visit, a yearly visit, the standard post-operative phase. But after that, when a person is stable, uh, 
they come in when they need us. And how about for the neurology team who's following hydrocephalus patients? Generally, I prefer to see my patients at least once a year. And the main reason is not all shunt dysfunctions or malfunctions are catastrophic and will present acutely. Sometimes shunt malfunction can be very insidious and slowly progressive. And when that happens, it can be difficult to say, is this truly related or not? When I see them yearly, I do a bit more detailed cognitive assessment, a bit more detailed gait assessment. So over time, I get a sense of how stable their performance is. And if I see a deviation from that change that's beyond what I would expect it for an age-associated decline, that raises my suspicion that maybe there's something wrong with the shunt. And again, it's to catch these more subtle malfunctions that's useful for me to see them once a year. I think that's one way in which our, our disciplines complement each other to give these patients good care. And I think that that's an interesting um, like practice that you've set up here at uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, both of you being in the um, Cerebral Fluid Center for CSF Disorders, which is a mouthful to say, everyone, um, is that you both work so well together and you both are always checking in on each other's patients. I know when Dr. Mogakar is seeing patients that that's being communicated to you how they're doing. So even if you don't get to see them, uh, see all the patients who are doing really well, you get that, that check-in from Dr. Mogakar about that. That's not the case for everybody in the country. They're not going to find that level of teamwork that you have developed here with the patient population. And so can we talk a little bit about the um, challenge um, or how patients can help be a part of managing their care when they might not have this teamwork? Because this would necessitate them then finding a neurologist who would be willing to see them maybe on a more regular basis for that monitoring, uh, even if it's every two years. And I, I would assume that every doctor is going to have their own comfort level of how often they see their patients. Um, and maybe run into neurosurgeons who don't want to see them when they're doing well. Um, and so I'm curious, like, uh, advice for how patients who are in areas where they're developing new relationships with adult providers, um, what they can expect and, and how they can communicate uh, with them. I think the first question is, how often do you want to see me um, to get, understand their doctor? And it's important to have a good physician who sees them over time. I mean, ideally a neurologist would be good, but a good internist may, may, may be good enough. And uh, it's important for continuity of care, somebody who knows them, somebody who has seen them and they're doing well, so that they can tell them if things are slowly starting to worsen, I think is, is important. So finding a good quarterback is very critical. Mm. Yeah, I think the key is a, a collaborative group or a collaborative uh, relationship between the neurosurgeon and any person even that's out there, their, their primary care that patient or that sent them in, the primary care physician that, that sent them in, or any physician out there that, as you say, knows them well. The key is, do they communicate and is there collaboration between them? And that's what you should sort of seek, that, that, that there is that communication. And as a patient, my internist or primary care physician is the main person kind of communicating with all the doctors, the neurologist, the neurosurgeon, any other specialist I have. And so I see her more often. And then my neurosurgeon, it's kind of like what you were saying, because I'm more complex and I'm in tune to my body, I see him as needed. And if I make it that year mark, we celebrate it. But my neurologist, because I manage, um, I have chronic pain, I see them every three months. So it just depends. It's very different on the pa patient. And you determine it with your medical professional. But the, the one theme that I am hearing, so this is actually, it wasn't as simple of an answer to this person's <laughs> question. Yes, find a doctor. It's really, um, it's a team because it is finding, if it's not the neurosurgeon who wants to see you, you know, every year or every two years, it's definitely making sure that you have, whether it's a neurologist or an internist, a primary care doctor who can be that person who knows you very well, who is seeing you once a year, um, who can help manage the different doctors that are on your team and communicate with you and for you um, and advocate for you. That seems to be really be the answer. So we would be, our, our advice then would be when you move to a new location to make sure that you find your primary medical home, that, that doctor that is going to serve as your primary advocate and medical uh, 
provider, whether that's an internist, a neurologist, a neurosurgeon. There are, we do know neurosurgeons who actually do uh, want to see their patients uh, every year. But find that one central doctor and then make sure that that doctor has good relationships with all of your other providers. But definitely identify a neurosurgeon because the last thing you want to do is be shaking hands and meeting your neurosurgeon for the first time 10 minutes before you're going into surgery. Hydrocephalus is a lifelong condition. There is no cure and you can go 20, 30 years without needing an intervention and then all of a sudden find yourself in an emergency situation. And I think Jen and I would definitely say, and I know that you would both concur, that none of us want to see you in that situation. So definitely take control of managing your care and finding those people who are really going to be your advocates. Any other words of advice? If you're looking for a doctor, HA has a physician's directory where you can search for a neurologist, neuropsychologist, and neurosurgeon, and they special, it, it's categorized by adults or pediatrics, so you can look in there as well. And that's on our website, www.hydroasoc.org. And of course, we're at the association, happy to take phone calls um, and assist you in any way that we can. So. With that, I will close this session and thank all of you for joining us today. Thank all of you for watching. And thank you for those of you that submitted questions through Facebook and Twitter to be a part of our Ask the Expert series. And we'll see you next time.